Okay, the Torah portion is Kitavo. And uh, it starts in the Eitz Chaim Chumash on page 1140. 1140. It's uh, Deuteronomy chapter 26. And it goes through chapter 20, part of chapter 29. Um, so this is, if last week we had a Torah reading that was super chock full of mitzvot, um, this Torah reading is much less so. The traditional uh, counters of the, Torah, of, the, of the Torah's mitzvot count six mitzvot altogether. And uh, spoiler alert, we don't have too many more mitzvot left um, of the 613. We're gonna get uh, um, to uh, the next uh, uh, Torah portion, uh, Nitzavim, and uh, that's gonna be it. We're gonna have the, our last mitzvot are gonna be in Parshat Nitzavim. So if, if it doesn't have a lot of mitzvot, then we imagine that it's gonna have the uh, not legal section, but some kind of narrative section. And uh, there's a uh, Kitavo is, is uh, you know, an interesting mix. Um, I don't know if narrative is exactly the right word. There's a lot of uh, exhortation and uh, um, it uh, has a huge section um, about half of the Torah portion is um, what's called the tochecha, the admonition. Um, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a whole long discussion about the terrible, terrible suffering and, and, and uh, situations that the Jewish people will undergo, exile, oppression, and, uh, and death and destruction. Uh, if they don't follow uh, the Torah. And, and uh, um, so that's a big section that, uh, in this Torah reading. The Torah be reading begins with our entering in the land. And uh, except for a little, a few psukim that follow the Tochecha, which get us again ready for entering into the land, the, the Tochecha itself is all about getting thrown out of the land. So a lot of what happens in this Torah reading is, on the one hand, in real time, Moses recognizes that Israel is on the threshold of entering the land, and he has to prepare them. These are certain rituals that you have to do, certain rituals will, which will be repeating rituals, certain rituals will be just one-time uh, recognitions of the, of the momentous change of the Jewish people from being a wandering people in the, in the wilderness to being a, a people that has their own homeland. Um, so there are a bunch of rituals that are mentioned by, by Moses in, uh, in recognition of that. And then, as I said, there's this long, uh, horrible thing which Moses says, don't take it for granted. Don't take it for granted that once you're in, you're in. Um, if you, if you uh, abandon God, you will lose all of the blessings that you will be enjoying in the land. And that becomes, again, the main uh, um, motif is blessings and curses, blessings and curses. Um, so so that's, that's uh, you know, the way it goes. The blessings and the curses are um, given ceremonial expression. So there's this very uh, uh, dramatic um, uh, ceremony of, of uh, when the children of Israel enter into the land, they're supposed to station themselves um, on two mountains that face each other, and then they're going to hear the blessings and the curses being uh, um, thrown at them, you know, pronounced out loud, and they're going to have to say amen, amen, to the blessings and to the curses. So there's this whole acting out, and there's also this fascinating uh, uh, act uh, project of setting up a kind of a Stonehenge uh, 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 situation where they're supposed to take these big rocks, big stones, and set them up and write the Torah on them so that they should be a monument 
uh, to the Torah. Um, again, that's something that uh, if it ever happened, um, you know, it, it disappeared a long, 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 long ago, and there's no, there's no residue of it. Um, and then going backwards to the beginning of the Torah, we have uh, the first uh, obligation, the first mandated prayer that uh, explicitly commanded to us in the Torah. Um, our practice is full of traditional prayers, uh, but none of the prayers that we recite um, are actually told to us in the Torah as prayers that have to be recited. This includes the Shema. The Shema is not a, um, it's not a prayer. It's not presented as a prayer in the Torah. And the Torah doesn't say that we have to recite this as a prayer. This is all rabbinic interpretation um, that uh, uh, followed in, in, uh, in the wake of the written Torah. But here at the beginning of the Torah reading, there is a prayer that must be recited by any farmer when they are finished with their harvest and they bring, they have to bring first fruits to the place that God will choose, to the temple, wherever that will be. The Torah doesn't specify. Um, and they have to go through a ceremony of gratitude, giving God the gift of the first fruits. And then the Torah says, and you have to say the following words. And uh, there's uh, um, the uh, Mikra Bikurim the recitation uh, out loud um, of uh, a prayer that uh, is about the first fruits and gives thanks to God. And only after you say that prayer, then you can enjoy the rest of your harvest. So that's one prayer. And the first prayer that the Torah tells Jews to recite. Uh, then there's a second prayer that we're commanded to recite. And that's what's called vidui ma'aser. It means the confession having to do with tithes, with, with, with giving the tithe. And there are a number of different types of tithing, um, of giving 10% of, of one's produce. Um, and every three years um, within a six-year cycle, and then that six-year cycle is stopped by Shemitah. And as I've mentioned a few times already, this Rosh Hashanah will start a Shemitah year. So the Shemitah year is the seventh year. So there are six years, just like six days of the week. There are six years until Shemitah. Those six years are divided up into two, three year sections. And there's a, a system of giving them tithes. There are three different types of tithes and they apply to those three years. Um, and after the three years are up, the Torah says, you have to make the following declaration that you have fulfilled God's commands and treated the tithing precisely the way God wants you to treat it, that you've given the tithes and that you haven't misused the tithes and that you haven't uh, uh, you know, been derelict in treating the tithes with the, with the holiness that they deserve. So you're supposed to say this every three years. So that's the second prayer. Um, these two prayers also have sort of fallen into, uh, how do you say the word, disuetude? Is that the way you say it? Does anybody know? That uh, means non-usage, you don't use it anymore. Um, and uh, the, uh, because we're not farmers on the land, uh, we don't have a temple anymore. We don't have these kinds of uh, um, practical uh, um, fulfillments of these mitzvot. Um, however, the first of these two prayers, the prayer of giving first fruits, became, because it was given every, it was recited every year by every farmer, it became very well known. And then it was used as a go-to text for a different mitzvah. Does anybody know which mitzvah it became? Uh, um, yeah, Jen. Part of our Seder. Absolutely, the, right. Yeah. It was, it was a central part of the Haggadah because since the prayer mentions getting out of Egypt and coming to the land, so it's a fulfillment of the mitzvah to remember our exodus from Egypt. 
And that became a go-to text, which was then extrapolated, explained, midrashized uh, in the Haggadah. Because the Haggadah assumed that everybody knew this text and everybody uh, you know, uh, was familiar with it and, and therefore was used in that kind of popular way. So it survives as a text that if you uh, follow the traditional Haggadah, you end up uh, going through uh, most of that text. Anyway, so that's all of the stuff, um, more or less, that's in our Torah reading. And uh, as always, I ask, is there any particular section of this Torah reading that people want to uh, focus on? So Jen, you've got your hand on up before I even um, finish the question. No, you know why? Because it, it's not actually, okay. the, yeah, yeah. we don't need to focus on it, but I wondered about Alter's translation and one tiny bit of that first prayer. Okay. So instead of a wandering Aramean, um, he has. Okay, so wait a second. Let's just get everybody uh, to the place where you are. Okay, uh, so this is. Six, five or six or something. I don't know, five. Somewhere right, it's in five. five. It's, it's, it's yeah. verse, uh, ch chapter 26, which is the beginning of our Torah portion. And it's five verses in from the beginning of Kitavo, where it says, and you shall. Uh, recite and say the following. Okay. Then he says, my father was an Aramean about to perish and okay. he went down to Egypt. And I wondered how you felt about that versus a more traditional wandering Aramean. Right. Whether, how, who felt about that? So so how you felt about it since you're, how I, yeah, I, I don't feel have funny. I thank, thanks for asking. I'm, I'm good. I feel, I feel okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, isn't um, it like yeah. a, a no, but this is, this is, it's reflected. He probably has a good note there that explains his choice. Um, but uh, his, his uh, choice of translation, who has, you know, the JPS, the regular translation that we usually use? Sarita, what do you got? Um, so it says, my father was a fugitive Aramean. Yeah, that's what All right. Has so, you know what? Right, let's read the whole thing. This is that prayer. Okay. So the, what, what the Torah says is you're a farmer. You have a harvest. You harvest your first fruits, um, you put them in a basket, you bring them to the temple, the Kohen, the priest is there to help you. And then uh, uh, you, uh, um, you start, you give you a prologue, right? And, and uh, that's on verse three. So let's just get that background. You come to the priest, verse three, Sarita. You shall go to the priest in charge at that time and say to him, I acknowledge this day before the Lord your God that I have entered the land that the Lord swore to our fathers to assign us. Okay, now remember, this is not just the first generation that enters to the land. This is um, acknowledging, which means also thanking. Um, uh, but here it's the word Haggadah, actually. Um, interesting, right? And I'm, I am stating publicly to God that I've arrived. I've arrived in the land. And this is supposed to be, again, recited every year. You know, the, according to the Torah, we should be in the land for thousands of years, no interruptions, no exiles. And every year we, we re-enter the land by uh, celebrating the, 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 the harvest. So then the priest, go ahead, verse four. The priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down in front of the altar of the Lord your God. You shall then recite as follows before the Lord your God. My father was a fugitive Aramean. He went down to Egypt with meager numbers and sojourned there. But there he became a great and very populous nation. The Egyptians dealt harshly with us and oppressed us. They imposed heavy labor upon us. We cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our plea and saw our plight, our misery and our oppression. The Lord freed us from Egypt by a mighty hand, by an outstretched arm, an awesome power, and by signs and portents. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Wherefore, I now bring the first fruits of the soil which you, our Lord, have given me. Okay, and there's one more line. Hold on. Keep on going. Turn the page. You shall leave it before the Lord your God. All right, that's it. Yes, but but you sh but that's the process. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And bow low before the Lord your God. Right. and then go off and have a good time. Right. So that's that's the that's the whole thing. So the 
the, the, the first words of this prayer in Hebrew are um, hard to, under, to understand and to translate. And we have our translation that most of us have as the, the, the Jewish Publication Society translation. And then Jen brings up Robert Alter's translation, which is different. The Hebrew is Arami Oved Avi. Okay, and so Arami means an Aramean. Avi means my father, literally. And Oved, it can mean a number of different things. This is Oved with an Aleph, not with an Ayin. So Oved can be, uh, is being lost, right? Um, so that's the wandering. Right? So the idea being that, that the, the, the syntax then is, Avi, my father, Arami Oved, was a Aramean who wandered around. Right? That would be one way to translate. However, other people translate it as an Aramean wanted to make my father be lost. So obeyed to be lost and obeyed therefore is also lost forever, right? And then that my father is not the subject of the sentence but the object of the sentence, right? So somebody is out to get my father. What Alter says is, let's have it, hear it again. Uh, my father was an Aramean about to perish. He okay. went and went down to Egypt, making it sound. That's why he went down to Egypt. So he, so he sort of like combines the two ideas. On the one hand, he keeps uh, my father as the subject, but he takes the Oved as, you know, being made to get lost, being not, not losing your way, but to perish, to be lost forever, right? So um, that's his, that's his, uh, um, way of translating the words. Now for us, these translations still beg the question, what exactly, who exactly, when is this being, is this referring to, right? What, what how far back, back are we going? What situation are we referring to? So it, let's yeah. take Alter for instance. Let's take Alter first. Okay, why not? So he says, my father was, an Aramean about to be about to perish. When would that have been? And then he went down to Egypt. So Abraham or Jacob would be very likely contenders then. Right. So it could be a, a, when it says my father, it's a kind of a generic, right? It, it's it could be any. This is a, a, a usual story among my 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 patriarchal uh, antecedents. They would be in trouble. And why were they in trouble? With uh, Jacob, it's the it's the uh, drought or the um, and famine. With, the famine, thank you. And with Abraham, um, it's I, the famine. I, I it's I the famine. Remember. Famine it's also. Famine. Right. Yeah. right. And and, and, uh, and actually, Isaac also. And Isaac threatened with famine, but then God says, "You're not going down to Egypt. You stay right." In the land of Israel, you go, you know, to the to the periphery. You stay with the with the Philistines. Don't you dare go down to Egypt. But he wanted to go down to Egypt, right? So each of them are in danger of perishing because there's no food to eat, there's no water to drink. Um, so they have to go down to Egypt, right? Um, and so that's one way to read it. Okay. Um, now let's go the other way. Um, my father was a wandering Aramean. That takes away the, the danger, the risk of, of uh, you know, perishing. Who would that be referring to? The same yeah, guy, same. again, yeah. Yeah. right? That would probably be the same, it's the same reference without that kind of, again, that, that threat of, of, uh, of, you know, dying. But what does the wandering conjure up for us then if we say wandering rather than at the, at the brink of, of extinction, at the brink it of kind Makes it sound just more like wanderlust, like, oh, let's check out Egypt. That uh, sounds more like Abraham, doesn't it? Um, 
okay, could be Abraham, but but then what? Uh, so so I mean, Jacob Jen, Jen, is, Jen is a big romantic. She thinks that wandering around is actually great. You know, it's like, you know, <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't do much. You're, like you're young. You've got your backpack. You know, you've got you know you know uh, you know Europe on on five cents a day or something like that. Um, so I saw a couple other hands. Merle, did you yeah. want? Yeah. Yeah. Um, my my translation. I'm using the um, Jewish Study Bible. It same, says same my translation. Yeah, it's it's not the same. It is. It says my father was a fugitive Aramean. No kidding. Yes. I'm shocked. Well, it's a different word, so I thought. Oh yeah, yeah, no, that that's what our translation is. Right, right. Yes. Oh, fugitive. Your, I thought it was. I thought. It, um, Wandering, right. Wandering. Yes. So, okay, so good. So, you're right, you're right, you're right. I was I'm like- I'm sorry, you, okay. No, 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 thank you. Uh, you, you. You pulled me back to the, to the facts. Um, so yes, uh, wandering is, is, is a common translation, but it's actually not the JPS translation. What I meant is the Jewish study Bible uses the same JPS translation that the Eitz Chaim Kumash uses. So, uh, but it actually is not wandering, it's fugitive. So fugitive gives us not so much of that kind of like easygoing wanderlust uh, association. What, what is, what is uh, but let's get to that in a half a second. Let's just use wandering for a second. Um, what's, what, what other features of wandering are there? Um, let's remember a more modern phrase, the wandering Jew. Right. The wandering Jew became a, uh, uh, I guess today we call it a meme. Um, uh, you know, it, it was a, uh, an image and it was, uh, became popular in the 19th century. And it was often used to convey a certain kind of uh, attitude toward Jews. Alan, do you, do you wanted to say something? No, they're, they're, they're seeking... Um... They're, they're, they're seeking their, their, their prosperity. They're seeking a living. In other words, the wandering Jew is sometimes a merchant who's going from place to place. Okay, to place. so that's, that's, that's not so terrible either. Um, what I'm thinking of, the of the is, uh, is something a little more dark. Yeah, Jen. Historically, it was used by the Catholic Church and others. Um, it's one of the teachings of contempt, what we call it now, and what the church actually calls it now is that Jews are, are damned to eternally wonder they'll never have a homeland, et cetera, et cetera, because of right. the of side. Right, so, so in other words, it's not a specific crisis that's happening. Oh, there's a famine, so therefore I don't have any uh, food and I have to find some new place to go. Um, it's, 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 it's specifically you know, uh, peculiar and, and appropriate to characterize these people. They're rootless. They don't have their own home. They don't have um, all of the associations that we have with having a home and a family. They're, they're, and be, that means that they don't have connections. They don't have connections specifically with us, the majority culture. Um, therefore, they're not to be trusted. Therefore, they're, uh, um, and, and to be ruthless is to be, back to our thematic uh, dichotomy, between blessing and curse, wandering is a curse. So, so some people read it, you know, as, and we have to all of these in, introductory, all of these understandings of that introductory phrase will then impact on how we understand the punchline of this prayer, right? So, uh, yeah, Jen, I was just thinking. Um, of, just again, the Catholic Church no longer teaches this. It's not it, they disavow it. Um, who won somebody who grew up with that was J.R.R. Tolkien, who was Catholic, but a Judeophile. <laughs> he has a very famous line, not all those who wander are lost. Right. And actually he used like the Jewish story to always show people coming home and ending up in a land. So there's right. that. And it, was, it wasn't all, not all Catholics, I guess. Hashtag. No, no, I'm not trying. I'm not trying to. Uh, no, no, no. I just uh, feel obliged to say this. <laughs> I'm not trying to attack the Catholics. I, you know, although no, I was the one who brought it up. I just feel like, so I just want to make right. it clear. But, the, but, but everybody. So this, this text predates the Catholics by quite a bit. Um, but what I'm saying is that that sense of if you're wandering, that's not good. 
that's not a good state for human beings to be state. That's a, a right, a, a good pun, right? It's not a good situation to be, to be stateless is not good. Um, there's a, you know, a whole bunch of political thought that um, if, if without a state, you have no rights. Human, human rights are, uh, you know, completely uh, 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 tied to having some kind of identity uh, of, a, of, uh, of, of a political, politically autonomous uh, uh, um, group. Um, stateless individuals today, all of our refugees, all of the, all of the people that are you know, moving throughout the, the globe, um, losing their homelands, losing their homes, their homes. Um, and then they're at the mercy of somebody else. You know, are they gonna be given a plane uh, ride to safety or not? Are they gonna be given an, you know, uh, entry uh, into uh, another place or not? And even if they're given an entry, is that, is that the solution to their problems? So wandering around is, is not the optimal uh, situation if it's not something that you're choosing as an adventure or as a, you know, something that you need to do to help build yourself up, you know, the, the buildings, uh, the education of, of, of the human being. So, so that's another way of reading it. And then we have, thank you, Merle, for pointing out, we have fugitive. Fugitive pushes that wandering uh, even more, right? And says, not wandering aimlessly, we don't know where we're going, but fugitive, we are running away from something. Yeah. So who's that? That sounds like Jacob. So that could be Jacob, right? That Jacob is running away and has no place to go. Now, we think of Jacob as running away from his brother Asaph. Does he run away to Egypt? No. He doesn't run away to Egypt. That happens much, much uh, later. That happens more in his old age, right? So the, um, the way that we end up connecting the dots in these different historical episodes is, you know, it could, we could be a little creative about it, but the rabbis put it out as the Aramean is not us. The Aramean is Lavan. Lavan wanted to destroy Jacob. Lavan is Lavan Ha'arami. So this is putting the word Avi as the object, not as the subject. And Lavan then becomes the paradigm. It's not simply that Lavan was mean and nasty and you know, duplicitous uh, with, with Jacob, but Jacob was subject to other people's anger or oppression or wickedness and that's us and that's not just a particular moment but it was our own situation uh, that eventually led us down to Egypt so again seeing this as a kind of a very very uh, um, condensed statement of history um, what I'm driving at is of course that this presentation is, this is where we started from. We started as either wandering or whatever our different translations are, or we're at the brink of perishing, or somebody is trying to perish us. Um, and all because we really don't have our own home. We really don't have solid ground to stand on. We don't have a place where we can feed ourselves. We don't have a place where we can shelter ourselves. And then by the end of this uh, uh, short prayer, we go, thank you, God, here I am. It's all over. It, 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 it worked out. Right? So that kind of dislocation, that sense of rootlessness or that sense of homelessness is now um, you know, washed away by the fact that you've brought us into this land, given it to us, and look, it's a fruitful, it's a good land, and and it's it's eretz zavat chalav So it's uh, it's it's so bountiful, just like you said, right? The, the, a land flowing with milk and honey is a phrase first created by God um, when God speaks to Moses and promises this land, and therefore thank you God, right? 
here's a basket, right? This is the original box of cake, you know, that, uh, you know, that you bring when you're, a, you know, when you're a guest, you know, to somebody, a bottle of wine, or, you know, or, you know some, some chocolates, right? So uh, this is the original version of uh, of doing that of saying thank you thank you for uh, for being so nice thank you for being so nice to us so um, yeah in those tiny that that three word phrase there's so so much packed into it right it's very uh, it's a very dense uh, um, uh, phrase with a lot of associations yeah. Okay, we've actually looked at that prayer a few times. So I'm gonna sort of a little bit um, say that I'm ready to look at something else. Um, what if we look at the other prayer? What if we look at the second prayer? The second prayer starts um, a little bit later. Uh, it's introduced in verse 12 and then the prayer starts in verse 13. Um, so, you know, what the heck, Sarita, you're, you're going to read for us. But, uh, but uh, Jen, keep an eye out for, for any strategic, uh, uh, you know, benefit for having uh, Alter's translation available. I'm sorry, can you just repeat the, the chapter? Start it, same chapter, first okay. 12. First 12, got it, thank you. Okay, Sarita, go ahead. When you have set aside in full the 10th part of your yield in the third year, the year of the tithe, and have given it to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that they may eat their fill in your settlements. You shall declare before the Lord your God. I have cleared out the consecrated portion from the house, and I have given it to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, just as you commanded me. I have neither transgressed nor neglected any of your commandments. I have not eaten of it while in mourning. I have not cleared out any of it while I was impure and I have not deposited any of it with the dead. I have obeyed the Lord my God. I have done just as you commanded me. Look down from your holy abode, from heaven, and bless your people Israel and the soil you have given us, a land flowing with milk and honey, as you swore to our fathers. Okay, so this is in some ways very connected to the previous prayer and to the previous situation, but there's some really uh, uh, big changes, uh, distinctions to be made between this prayer and the previous prayer. So to start, the previous prayer gives us a whole short Reader's Digest history of the Jewish people, right? And then it ends with, thank you, God. Look at how fortunate I am. Um, and, and here, you know, here's, here's a, a present to, to show how grateful I am to you for being so nice to me, right? That's pretty much the prayer that the first one was. How do we see the second prayer? What, what's going on in the second prayer? Yeah, Jen. Um, well, there's, there's parts that are just really beautiful, like how you have to take care of, it says sojourner here or stranger in the other translation to the, um, to the orphan and to the widow after you've rooted it out of your own house, um, according to what God has commanded. Um, I, I'm really interested in the prohibitions, however, um, like, uh, that, uh, okay, I understand I have not eaten of it in mourning. I, I'm not sure why you can't do that. I have not rooted it out while unclean. Okay. And so you should be purified when you're rooting it out, but, and I have not given of it for the dead. I feel like, well, what's wrong with offering your, you know, your dead mom or dad, their favorite meal or something. I've seen people do that. That's like, why are we prohibited from doing that? That's a, that's a very, uh, um, you know, very common uh, religious, yeah. uh, impulse and ancestor worship or ancestor gifts are, uh, are uh, very, very common in, in religious practice. And here it seems to be actually eschewed. How's that? Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, so, uh, so you brought up a lot of points. First of all, just in general, without going into the details of it, this is, as the Hebrew term goes, it's a vidui, right? Which means it's a confession uh, rather than 
a, uh, um, a, a, a prayer of thanks, of gratitude. This is saying, God, I really tried not to mess this up. I did what you wanted. I tried my best to, perf to perform all of these commandments, to do all of these uh, uh, tithings that you, that you did it. And I tried to do it the right way. So I've done my best. Okay, that's, that's the first part of this prayer. So it's, it's uh, and then that's, none of that is in the first prayer, right? The first prayer doesn't go, here's my first fruits. I've really tried to find a nice basket for you. This is the best I could do with, you know, all the other good baskets were sold out, you know, and, and whatever it is, you know, there's, there's no apologies. There's no, you know, uh, uh, but, or, you know, I hope in, in the first prayer. Actually, it's opposite. You know, the first prayer is, God, you did all of this for us. And we are now reciprocating. We are bringing to you our first fruits. Here it's, okay, God, we really tried. We know we don't do as well as you do. Um, we make mistakes, but we really, really tried. And so therefore, will you now sort of continue to bless us? Right, excellent. So let's, let's, pull, let's push that a little bit further. When you go, it's these opposites, right? Who are we giving the gift to in the first prayer? God. Right. And back to what Jen said before, who are we giving these gifts to in the second prayer? The poor. The, right. the poor are the ones who are absolutely explicitly mentioned. So that's where we have to actually also back up a little bit. There are three types of tithing. One tithe is given every year. It's given year one, two, and three. And then in the second three-year cycle, it's given again in four, five, and six. That tithe is given every year. That's the tithe to the Levite. So that's mentioned you know, before. You have to give a tithe to, Le to the Levite. Why? They don't have their own land. They can't, they can't produce. Because they're poor, right? But they're a very identifiable sector of the poor, right? They're poor because they don't have any other wherewithal to, to, to make a living. They don't have land. So you got to support them. So that's the first, that's what's called Maaser Rishon, the first Maaser. And that's throughout all of those years, all six years. Then there's called Maaser Sheni, the second Maaser, the second tithe. The second tithe is given to whom? Jerusalem. It's given to yourself. But you give it to yourself in Jerusalem. That is, you set aside a tenth of your produce and you have to bring it with you to Jerusalem and enjoy it there. You have to enjoy it in front of God. When it's, I mean, the Torah doesn't say Jerusalem. So you have to enjoy it in front of God, in front of the temple. It's gotta be part of this kind of like pilgrimage culture. But the beneficiary of that tithe is you. You're giving it to yourself. So that happens in year one and year two. And then it happens in year four and year five. But the third year of each of these three year cycles, the there's another tithe that supplants the, the Maaser Sheni, the, the second tithe. And instead of giving it to yourself, you give it to the poor. Not the, Levite, not, the Le not the Levite necessarily, but the poor. It's not an annual, it's once every three years. That's besides the annual gifts that you have to have the corner of your field for the poor, that you have to give stucco all the time, that you have to do all, that's every year, every day, whenever. But then this is the third year of the cycle, the sixth year of the cycle. And this is tellingly called the tithing year, hmm. right? That's what it says, the third year, the year of the tithe. And that's the one where you're giving it to the Le Levite and the stranger and all the other classes of poor people that are mentioned. So the main idea of a tithe, says the Torah, is not so much the tithe that you give all the time and not even the tithe that you give most of the time, but it's the tithe that you give to the poor, right? Across the board, the Levite, of course, but also everybody else. Yeah, Alan. I just, just, I just try to understand, is that 30%? Is that 
No, it's 10% each time. No, but the third year where you give to the poor and the Levite. No, it's then, so it's 20%. It's the tithe to the, to the Levite and then a tithe to the poor. Every year, there's actually 20% of your produce goes someplace. I agree. Right? So this is in, 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 instead of, but again, the, the 10% that's, uh, the, of the 20%, half of it is going to you the other, the other years. And then you and then everybody else, you can, you know, you can, you can, you can uh, share it. You can share your bounty with other people. Um, so that's, that's what's happening here. And now we say, according to this, to this uh, uh, declaration, and I really, I came through, I did this, right? I have been scrupulous in making sure that I've given this to where it's supposed to go. Um, Jen. So um, it feels like, does, does anybody else have these obligations apart from farmers? So if you live in the city plying your trade, are you if, exempt if you have from a garden. tithing? No. Only if you have, this is only produce. It's only food. Okay. So you don't, like if you're a shoemaker in town, you're not tithing anything. You don't, right. You don't give a tenth of your shoes to, to anything. Yeah. Okay. Right. right. Yes. So, but let's think for a second now. If this is about, I really, really made sure that the people who are supposed to get this, get this. Jen, does that go any way forward toward answering your question about the dead? Um, so I guess if, if it's saying that this, what's supposed to be tithed, didn't go to any other purpose than to what I'm supposed to be tithing to, then it doesn't, then it might not be a prohibition on giving it to the, giving food to the dead. So in other words, like it's just say this can't be, you can, whatever else you're using your, the rest of your food for, what you're setting aside to tithe can only be used for right. these particular things. This tithe so then, that's right, not a has to go to living people who are hungry. Right? I can't use it for any other spiritual, you know, needs that I have or any other, uh, you know, things that I think are, are important to do. No. Now, whether you should actually give things to the dead is a whole other thing. The Torah talks about it in other places that you have to be careful not to, you know, consort with spirit uh, diviners and, and, and things like that. Um, yeah, Sarita. So... It might be that these particular things are being said because these might be situations in which you are likely to use what should be given to the poor. I'm in mourning, you know, <laughs> there's, you know, um, or um, I don't quite know about the impure thing, but, um, and I, but relating to being in mourning and wanting to sort of- Oh, so, so look at the verb, what's, what's, the verb? what's the verb? What's the verb about the mourning? Well, actually, does it? It's um, it does relate to, to being dead, to, to to being. No, no. What does it say? What about mourning? What it, happens? What's not supposed to happen when you're in mourning? Be in contact with the impure. No, what yeah. does it say? It says as a verb here. I have not eaten. Right, eaten. So, so in other words, which which tithe is being referred to there? The, the, the tithe for yourself. I have not. The tithe that I give to myself, where I'm supposed to go to Jerusalem and enjoy this uh, bounty of mine in this holy place, right? It's a destination vacation, right? We all go to, we go to Jerusalem and we have a great time and we've got, you know, all these dried figs and, and dates and all kinds of good stuff. And we've got, you know, uh, um, all of the bounty that, that, that God has given us and we pack it up and we bring it to Jerusalem and then what happens, this part of, uh, related a little bit to the theme that I talked about in, the, in my Torah Sparks, we're supposed to be happy. We're supposed to be happy with this bounty. So here, what, what is being said is, I did not eat this bounty in a state of mourning. Right? Lo achalti ba'oni mimen. Right? Um, what if you're in a state of mourning? then give it to somebody else. What if you're in a state of impurity? That's the other part. And that might've been because that, you attended the funeral? So that, so that, so the state of impurity doesn't apply to the, again, each thing applies to different uh, uh, tithes. The tithe of eating the Maas in Jerusalem has to be eaten in holiness. 
in purity, the poor people's tithe doesn't. So this is about when you, you know, you're not supposed to give away something that has to be eaten in purity. The Levite has to eat it in purity. Don't mess it up so that they can't eat it. Right? So if you're impure, get out of the way and let somebody else dispense the food. Right? So that, that's, that's the way it's, you know, it has to be sort of unpacked traditionally. Right? So um, each of the, the, the assumption is we know about, that's why it's the three years. We've already heard about the three year cycle. We know that there's those different varieties. And now we start uh, uh, you know, parsing out which of these rules applies to which of them. And guess what? I've been attentive to all of them. I have done my absolute best to make sure that these gifts go where they're supposed to go. Um, you know, this, we're gonna have uh, a, a Saturday night a presentation. We're looking forward to a presentation from Tony's Kitchen, right? That's a modern day kind of equivalent of this, right? That this is, we, you know, this is saying to God, okay, you know, you've given me these mitzvot that I should be a giver, just like you're a giver. So I've done my best to do that. And then as has been pointed out, verse 15 is not thank you God for being so nice to me, but a prayer for the future, right? Let's read it one more time, 15. Look down from your holy abode from heaven and bless your people Israel and the soil you have given us, a land flowing with milk and honey as you swore to our fathers. Okay. Um, how does this uh, sound to everybody? Does, uh, is, there's a, a kind of an imagery here, right? There's a spatial imagery. Look down from your heavenly abode. You live up there. We live down here. But you know what? Take a look out the window for a second, right? Um, the hashkifa, right? Means, you know, crane your neck out and, and, look, and look out and, and uh, see what, what, your, what, your, what your children are doing, right? Um, this is, you know, a, a, uh, you know, a pretty uh, basic kind of uh, um, almost childish idea about where God is and where we are. We have it sometimes in, in um, for instance, in Hallel in the Psalms, right? Hashamayim, shamayim l'ashem. Ve'aretz natan l'bnei adam. The heavens that belong to God and, uh, you know, the land was given to human beings, right? Um, and, and at the beginning of Hallel, we have that also, um, that, that God looks down, right? And, and uh, um, you know, sees what's going on among us. So um, there's this awe that's supposed to be, I think, conveyed by this, an awe, and yet you don't have, you're, 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 you know, you're up someplace else, and yet look at what you're doing for us, right? Look at, look at how you're, you're treating us. I hope you will continue to bless us. Jen. I, I wonder too, though, if it's a reaction against, um the earth as a, as a deity also, like mm -hmm. basically going out of our way to make sure that we separate Shemaim from the Haaretz, uh, from the earth. So. Right, right. So that's for sure, I think you're right. I think that that's for sure. The, and that's of course, the, all the way back, that's the way the Torah starts. The earth and the, and, the, and, and the heavens themselves are all creations of God who is beyond earth and heaven. As, as being the, 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 the uh, soil out of which God might be born or grow. Um, but that's what makes the awe that much more uh, um, astounding from the traditional uh, perspective, that God didn't have to do this, right? That God is not subject to any of this. Um, and nevertheless, God has... Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, knelt over, bent over, looked out, taken care, and given to us, and continues to give to us. 
And so it's it's um, you know it's 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 a uh, a transcendent and an and an imminent dynamic at the same time, which many people, especially today, I don't know, maybe especially today, but certainly, it's not it's not such an easy dynamic to hold on to. Uh, for many people, um, even if you don't see God in some kind of pagan way, it's the imminence of God that is relatable. Right? God is that, you know, force that's within human beings to be good, or that, or or however else we we, we think about it. God God is in the goodness that we're all uh, uh, trying striving for, and 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 uh, the spiritual realities that that we're capable of. This is a, a much more bipolar, actively, you know, uh, uh, what can I say, engaged idea that, yes, God is here and God is within us and we're created in the image of God and, and, uh, and, and God is everywhere. And yet there's this also this acknowledgement that God is way beyond any of the everywhere that we uh, that we can think of. Um, and of course, then we think of it, right? Then we put God, you know, with a long white beard sitting on a chair, you know, up there. Um, and when we do that, of course, we're just, you know, defeating the dynamic um, again. But uh, um, that's, that's the prayer. That's the prayer. Um, God, we hope that you will reward us or that you will imitate us. We imitate you, now you imitate us. Right? We, and that's one of the mitzvot, by the way, that is in this Torah reading, according to the traditional count of, uh, of uh, the, the, um, the scholars that count out the 613 uh, commandments, that um, we're supposed to walk in God's ways. Right? V'halachta bidrachav. So it's mentioned in other parts of the Torah, but it's mentioned here also explicit, explicitly. Um, and unfortunately, where did I put the, I'm not gonna remember what verse it is, but that's it. Well, Allah, his ways is, is in verse uh, 17. There you go. So you have that? affirmed this day that the Lord is your God, that you will walk in his ways. That right. you will observe his laws and commandments. Blah, blah, blah. Right. So that's verse 17. 17. Yes. Right. So that's, that's to walk in God's ways. So it's mentioned a few times. But there is the imperative, you shall walk. You've, so here it's, I've, you've agreed to do that. Hold on a second. We've got, we've got a, uh, 60 seconds. So while you're looking, though, one yeah. of the things that really strikes me about this, um, this prayer is that it's really a prayer for continuity. Um, I mean, you know, God, you told us this was a land flowing with milk and honey, keep it going. Um, and you swore to our fathers, it should, don't just have that be once, but let's, the relationship is ongoing. Right. 28, nine. 28, nine. Okay. 28, Nine. Okay. Twenty-eight. Nine. Yeah. Okay. Alan, you found it. You read it. The Lord will establish you as his holy people, as he swore to you, if you keep his commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Right. So if is one way to translate it. Another translation, the word is key. So when, or in consequence of the fact that you must do the following. Right? And this is read as an imperative, not just as, well, if you do walk in God's ways, it'll be nice. Um, so how do you walk in God's ways? We have this also in our morning prayers. Can, how can you walk in God's ways? God is, is uh, ineffable. God is, is transcendent. God is scary. God is a fiery, you know, uh, force. The answer is mahurachum avatarachum. Just as God is compassionate, you have to be compassionate. So um, we imitate God. And now we're saying to God, okay, so let's play this game of mutual imitation. 
right? We do, we do the giving. Now we hope that you'll be uh, pleased enough to continue doing the giving and keep the continuity going. All right, Yashakoach. We're going to stop here. Thank you.